And believe it or not, the final meeting of the Interim Joint Committee on Transportation for the 2022 Interim. Um, before we call the roll, remind everybody to put your phone on silent or stun. And, and um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Senator Berg. Senator Hornback. Senator Smith. Senator Storm. Senator Turner. Senator Wheeler, Here. Senator Wilson, Senator Wise, Senator Yates, Represent Branscom. Here. Represent Bratcher. Here. Represent Bridges. Here. Represent Dixon. Represent Fleming. Present. Represent Hale. Present. Represent Heverin. Present. Represent Regina Huff. Representative Thomas Huff. Here. Representative Lewis. Representative Maddox. Representative McCool. Here. Mm -hmm. Representative McPherson. Here. Representative Miller. Here. Representative Palumbo. Here. Representative Santoro. Here. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Stevenson. Here. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Representative Thomas. Present. Representative Westrom. Representative Wheatley. Co-Chair Upchurch. Here. Chairman Higdon. Here. We do have a quorum. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from last minute. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Before we start our agenda today, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege. Today marks the last meeting for one of our Senate members and three of our House members that have served this committee faithfully for many years. Uh, our Senate member who's retiring is Senator Paul Hornback. Um, Paul's not here today, but I want to thank him for his dedication and service to the Transportation Committee. Um, as you all know, Paul Hornback is very reserved. He seldom lets us know what his opinion is. <laughs> and he's also very, very reluctant and very reserved about asking about transportation projects in his district. And I will certainly miss those qualities um, as, and we will miss Paul Hornback. He has um, uh, been a very, very um, good member of this, uh, outstanding member of this committee and an outstanding senator for, for many years, and we will miss Paul Hornback. And to him, uh, Godspeed and best wishes um, as he, um, I guess, rides his tractor off into the sunset. Um, I'll yield to um, Representative Up Upchurch to mention our three House members who, who are retiring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have Regina Huff, uh, Sal Santoro, and Susan Westrom who are retiring. Um, Regina's not here, but uh, kind of like uh, Senator Hornback, you know, she keeps her opinions to herself. <laughs> and uh, we've all grown to know and love uh, Representative Huff uh, since she uh, has served in the House. Uh, we wish her uh, well in her endeavors after she leaves and rides off into the sunset. Uh, I'm sure we will probably hear more from her uh, afterwards. Uh, Representative Westrom, uh, it's, personally it's been an honor serving with you. Uh, you and I were elected uh, at the same time, set together during freshman orientation back when uh, uh, photography was done here at the LRC with <laughs> black and white uh, pictures. And uh, so we have progressed <clears throat> quite a ways. So, but you will be missed and, and uh, congratulations on your retirement. I'm sure you will enjoy it a lot more than putting up with some of the shenanigans up here. <laughs> and lastly, and certainly not least, is uh, Representative Sal Santoro. Um, Sal, you're going to be missed. Um, just to say the least, he's going to be missed. Um, I don't know of anyone who has ever had an unkind word uh, to say about Sal. Uh, everyone. <laughs> well, we've always got the peanut gallery <clears throat> but uh, Sal can give it as well as he can take it and uh, 
uh, Sal is just one of those special, unique uh, individuals that everyone has uh, grown to love uh, during his tenure up here. And uh, if, uh, his advice, uh, his uh, knowledge of not only just the legislative process, but transportation in general, uh, I think is, is very valuable, uh, not only to this body, but uh, anything that he sets out to do in the future. And Sal, uh, we are truly going to miss you and your service. Godspeed. And thank you, Representative Buck Church. And, and I also have served with all three of the House members who are retiring, um, Representative Huff, Representative Westrom, and Representative Santoro. And, and it's been indeed an honor and a privilege to serve with you all and, and logged a lot of hours um, over the years with uh, with Sal and um, he uh, he's been a a really a mentor to me as in the transportation committee and and I will I do appreciate all your work and we'll miss you. Leave us your phone number when your new number. Make sure we have it. <laughs> okay, our first order of business today is the long awaited. I'll say it again, long-awaited update and implementation of the new automated vehicle information system, CAVIS. So um, if you all would please, Matt, um, good one, and Heather, would you all please come and um, introduce yourself for the record, and um, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, turn your microphone on. Did did Matt decide not to attend with <laughs> you today? He's here. Oh, there he is. Come on, Matt. I'm Heather Stout, Executive Director of IT for the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Matthew Cole, Commissioner for the Department of Vehicle Regulation at Transportation. John Eiler, CAVIS Project Manager. Please, the floor is yours. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, we're here today to tell you guys about the CAVIS program, um, the update uh, today. And if you don't already know, CAVIS is a system that will replace the Avis mainframe system. This project is about modernizing, um, decommissioning Avis, modernizing um, the processes, and um, bringing some consistency throughout the state in um, the CAVIS system. John's going to give uh, the majority of the presentation, but we're all here for questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you all for allowing me to come up here and, and talk about CAVIS and represent the people on my team and show you all the great progress we made over the course of the program. Um, first and foremost, I do want to highlight some of the significant achievements we've made over the course of the program. We've implemented seven of the eight uh, key features and modules of the CAVIS program, um, going all the way back to May of 2015 with the print on demand, where we really modernized how we intake paper and turn that into a digital um, usable access within our system, uh, web renewal, implementing disabled placards, our statewide point of sale, which was the first point of sale that was actually in every county across the Commonwealth, um, which everybody uses for a standardized process for their point of sale solution, building out the vehicle foundation, which is setting up the entire Commonwealth to be successful, uh, utilizing this system uh, whenever we start to go live uh, this coming year. Uh, decommissioning and implementation of our inventory solution. Um, and then one of the biggest achievements lately was the implementation of our flat plate project. Uh, the next and, and last module of the CAVIS program is the uh, vehicle module, where we are dealing with trucks and cars, trailers, mobile homes, and other key vehicle types. On the right-hand side, I'm, I'm actually gonna go into another slide that's gonna show this in a bigger format so you all can see our, our key deliveries over the next um, few months. Right now, we're still in a development cycle um, where we're gathering and defining and refining and designing and developing the key um, requirements for us to launch all of the remaining vehicle types. Um, this should take approximately between now and the summer of 2023 to finalize all of that development. In the meantime, we also have to do, do other key aspects of project development, which is load testing and system performance testing to make sure that whenever we do hand over this system that it's usable, um, there's no issues, everybody can log in at the same time through all the different counties, making sure they can handle the significant load of all the new vehicle types. Um, and we plan on doing that between Q1 and Q2 of next year. 
also one of the key aspects of launching a program this large is making sure that the people can actually use it whenever they get the program. Um, so training, engagement, awareness, understanding, and truly um, being able to grasp and, and utilize the system in a training environment before they actually uh, start using it in real life to get them prepared um, is integral into our uh, success and critical path. Also, we plan on doing uh, what's called a UAT or a user acceptance testing where we bring in end users um, cyclically throughout our incremental and iterative development and have them use the system and they say, yes, this is exactly what I need to do my job or no. And if it's a no, we take that back, refine it, fix it, and then send it back out for them to review again. Um, that's happening around the Q2 timeframe, right as we get ready to prepare for cutover. During Q3, we're looking at a cutover timeline where we can start decommissioning the legacy uh, application, Avis, and then start turning on Kavis so that everybody can start using it full time. Um, after we launch, there's also a, a time frame of stabilization. So this, the clerks have been using this Avis system since the late 70s and early 80s. So they've been ingrained in using that mainframe application. There's a lot of learning, a lot of understanding, and a lot of change, and we understand that. Um, so between the training and awareness and then a stabilization period, um, where we're going to have our team fully devoted to providing support and engagement for those that need the support and help um, while they're serving the citizens of the Commonwealth. That should take approximately two to three months to, to become stable, and then um, everything should be uh, working as it should at that time. Previously, we stated an implementation date of the winter um, of this year, the December, January timeframe. Uh, we looked at a, a shift in that timeline. Uh, basically, the causation of that is loss of key performing members on the team, um, and then replacing those members to backfill the openings that we had on the, on the team. Um, the impact was a, a shift or a, a productivity loss for our team and delivery, and then that directly translated into a timeline shift. Uh, right now, we're trying to make up that time through uh, different aspects of bringing additional people from other teams onto our team, engaging them into the development cycle, and making sure that they're ready to deliver just as the uh, previous members did, and we've already implemented that. Um, and then we came up with a new date of summer 2023 so that we can actually deliver um, a product that can be used and will be stable and, and available for the county clerks to use. Um, there could be some things that we need to actually take out of scope. They, there could be a limited impact on functionality that, that maybe happens every once in a while. Um, they're called like edge cases or, or they happen one out of a million times. We can't plan and code to everything. And so those things are actually being documented currently um, based on some data analysis and, and requirements analysis. And those are documented and we're gonna actually build out manual workarounds if needed. We're gonna have open discussions with our end users about the impact of those items. And then we're going to actually uh, mitigate that risk through uh, different methods. Um, another key assumption for the summer of 2023 is maintaining the current scope in which um, we have to deliver to. So if that grows, then the timeline could grow. Um, and then also keeping the same people that we have on the team. We have an amazing team. They're amazingly talented. Um, keeping those people on the team all the way through the end of the project will be key for our success. Currently, the CAVIS projected allocation is $19,946,665. Uh, we spent almost all of that budget except for about $1.1 million. Um, and we spend most of that money on the labor and talent of this team. And this is the life cycle of the budget. That's all we've got. Do you guys have any questions? That's it? Yes, sir. <laughs> that sounds, sounds good. It, it, um, like I said, it's finally uh, going to happen that this is fully implemented, and that's, that's great. Um, one of the couple questions, and looking around to see if we have any, anyone else to jump in here, but um, of course on the, um, on the license plates, I understand the personalized or the uh, specialty plates. Um, 
you know, in the past, if a group wanted to um, have a plate, they had to pre-sale so many um, plates. What will we be doing now? And that's supposed to be simplified as we move forward once these, um, the, this is total, uh, totally implemented. That is correct. The um, creation of specialty plates is definitely simplified in the CAVIS system versus um, the way it is in AVIS. And um, like all the new specialty plates that are uh, slated to uh, be live, I think with the CAVIS implementation, will all go in at, at one time and be available to um, citizens at that time. Do you know off the top of your head the qualifications going forward for new for those uh, those type plates? I do not. Godwin may know. Yeah. Hey, uh, introduce yourself for the record and please proceed. My name is Godwin Onodu and I'm the director for the motor vehicle licensing. We have approximately uh, seven new applications. For is your mic on, please? I pull it closer to you. The, the green light's blaring. Yeah. Pull it closer to you. We have a proximate. Can you hear me? No. Here, use this one. The light's on. Though. The light's on. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Great, great. Uh, as I just uh, mentioned, we have approximately seven to eight organizations that apply for new special license plate. They have been approved, and we're just waiting for the implementation of KVIS. Uh, in, as you stated, in the past, we usually require 2,500 uh, uh, signatures. With the new process, none of those signatures are required. Uh, also, in the past, when we used to implement this through the AVI system, it was causing transportation cabinet almost $50,000 to implement one organization special plate. With the new KV system, we are estimating that it's gonna be about $2,500 or even less. So immediately we have the last rollout for the KVs. All those plates will be produced at the same time. What were the, what were the um, I guess, restrictions um, for these new plates? Um, what organizations can do do that? If, uh, I mean, I'm I've under, understood it in the past, and that twenty five hundred dollar um, twenty five hundred plate uh, or the twenty five hundred signatures really restricted the number of requests that you had. Um, just curious how this will work. If I wanted to start the San Santoro um, fan club and sell license plates, how many? How would that work? Uh, you, first of all, you have to qualify as the organization uh, 501C, and uh, the only requirement now is once the plates are produced, the threshold is 500. So you are required to maintain 500 registrations. Uh, if second year and that 500 is not maintained, then your, your, your plate will cease to exist. But there's no other requirement except applying for, and we make sure that the design of the license plate meets the standard for the AMVA and uh, toll roads. So the 25, in the past, yes, the restrictions were those uh, 2,500 uh, signatures, but the new process doesn't require it. And the only th way we can then monitor the plate is after each fiscal year or end of the calendar year depending on the organization's account cycle, that will look at, the, at those 500 threshold. Okay, well, that, thank you very much. That, that you, answers sir. my question. Thank you. Um, on insurance, I know we've talked for years that, um, that when, when this was implemented, it would help us with those who um, did not have insurance. Um, the, um, how, how will this implementation, will, will that help? with the uh, finding out who, who has, uh, what vehicles have auto have insurance and which ones do not? The current process doesn't. However, KYTC in conjunction with other states are looking into how the insurance system can tie in with KVIS, so if you. Yeah, um, when KVIS is implemented, it will be um, integrated with the current insurance system that's in place. 
one of the projects that will be on the time on the pipeline after Cavis is implemented is to then replace the insurance system with something more real time, um, probably through a third party service provider, a vendor that can help us bring all the data in, process the data um, more quickly, and you know improve that um, that process overall. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I don't see any further questions. Um, thank you all. We look forward to full implementation of the CAVA system. Thank you. Next, next up is the uh, KYTC regulation of junkyards or auto recyclers, I think is the Please identify yourself for the record and and please proceed. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. My name is Stacy Tamol. I'm a transportation. Stacy, it's hard to hear. Pull that microphone closer to you. Is that better? Make sure it's on. Okay. Much better. Okay. My name is Stacy Tamol. I'm a transportation engineering specialist with the Department of Highways in the Permits Branch. Um, we would like to change the definition of the word road in KRS 177.905. And this definition is referenced in all of our recycler statutes. The current definition of road means any county, state, federal, or limited access highway, <clears throat> including bridges and bridge approaches. We would like to change that to mean any highway designated as part of the national highway system, which includes the interstate highway system, including bridge and bridge approaches. This change would bring us in line with the minimum federal standards for, um, for state jurisdictions over recyclers. Now, what, <clears throat> ask you a question, what would the other, um, that used to be called roads that uh, what will they be called now well those will be relegated to to local jurisdiction um currently we we have some local jurisdictions that already have ordinances on recyclers some of which are um more strict than ours but our recommendation would be for municipalities to implement uh standards similar to to what we have in the law today Okay, Senator Wheeler has a question. So, so are we talking about like millings and stuff from when they do road repairs? Are we talking about cans collected? I guess I'm a little confused. We're talking about junkyards. So it, there's okay. a, like if, if any location that has um, like a, a certain minimum amount of wrecked cars, salvage material, scrap metal, that, that kind of thing. So you won't be able to basically see it from the road uh, does this have to do with the Highways Beautification Act? That yeah. Okay. I yeah, our I... our current law, um, we we have jurisdiction over um, all all of those road types. If the recycler is within a certain distance of the roadway, I believe it's a thousand feet, and if it can be seen from the roadway, then the transportation cabinet currently has jurisdiction over those recyclers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, and and. Um, in full disclosure, we've had a lot of conversations about this issue. There was legislation filed, I think, last year, and um, CACO and the League of Cities have had, you know, wanted clarification. Want to make sure we do this, we do it the right way. And basically what it does, it, it the um, Transportation Cabinet will have uh, oversight on those that are on that national highway system, um, all other recyclers, uh, a.k.a. junkyards, will be under local control and, and um, over, uh, oversight by the cities and counties where they're located. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Please proceed. Um, that, that's all we had. <coughs> okay. Thomas, Representative Huff has a question. I have a concern on that. If it was left up to local jurisdictions, they could make it their own policy, like a public nuisance policy, and basically put auto recyclers out of business 
Well, some jurisdictions already have ordinances that are more strict than ours. So, so that could happen today with our current statutes. Representative Smith has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and following up on what the representative just said, <clears throat> my concern in eastern Kentucky is uh, I thought there was already some sort of law there that it had to be a fencing that uh, would protect the view of the scrapyard or junkyard that you're talking about. Yeah. My concern would be then you're backing up and leaving it as local control and it, so it wouldn't be a state issue because we've recently had a state issue on uh, business in 119 going to Harlan uh, where they sit on the side of the road mm -hmm. and uh, they were I believe fined pretty hefty uh, for uh, they say disturbing the the roadway um, are you passing this down to local or are you still holding your ground on the state level uh, could you kind of elaborate on who's going to be doing what? Well, for um, it, it sounds like the case you're talking about, they they had items on our right of way. And so the transportation cabinet would continue to pursue um, any recycler that encroached on our right of way, just like we would any type of encroachment. But otherwise, um, if it's on their property, yeah, it would, it would go down to local jurisdiction and um, our current statutes have screening re requirements, which is usually fencing, and we would recommend that the local jurisdictions follow um, the screening requirements that we currently have. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. So <laughs> could you tell me what the penalty will be uh, if, this, if this is done here, what you're asking for? Uh, the penalty phase for, uh, does that get passed on to local jurisdiction to be subject to the penalties or will the state still enact uh, be an, the enforcer? I, I believe that will be local jurisdiction uh, for all but um, junkyards located on the National Highway System. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Turner has a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A follow-up to that. Now, 119 is a federal highway. Yes. So you wouldn't lose jurisdiction over that roadway, would you? Um, some federal highways, certain sections of it are within the national highway system. Um, I can follow up with you and send you a, a map of the national highway system. Well, I'm not sure if 119 or what portion of 119 would fall under NHS. We'll follow up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Well, if it's not, so, so you're saying then parts of the federal highway system are under your control and regulation and other parts are not? Well, today, all of um, the county roads, all state federal routes are under our jurisdiction. If we change the definition to only routes within National Highway System, then some of the federal routes would be under local jurisdiction. Follow up again, Mr. Yes, sir. So you have a written document that is going to show us what parts of our roads now that are going to be considered federal regulated and which not even though they're federal highways yeah i can i can supply you with a map of the the nhs routes um that's a a common classification used at transportation cabinet and we we readily have maps available that i can supply you thank you mr chairman thank you this is a uh, priority piece of legislation from the transportation cabinet and we will properly vet this we'll make sure that everyone has a um uh, information on what uh, recyclers in your district will be covered and which ones won't. We'll make sure that CACO and League of Cities that they that they weigh in on this. So we will vet this and make sure that it's uh, that we're, we're not uh, doing something that uh, would cause a lot of uh, consternation at the local level. Uh, seeing no further questions, thank you and we look forward to seeing you during session. Thank you. Next up, uh, Representative Tipton, hand-free operation, it says a motor vehicle. 
Det blir ett tal om så. I brought a prop, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Just for demonstration purposes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Where's your steering wheel? I, I couldn't figure out how to get it off. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the invitation today. I am Representative James Allen Tipton. Uh, from House District 53. Uh, for those of you who this sounds familiar, uh, this is the third time I have presented this proposed piece of legislation before the Interim Joint Committee on Transportation. And if you happen to serve on the House Banking and Insurance Committee, uh, we presented it for discussion only in the 22 session. But uh, as most of you who know me know, I am persistent. Uh, and I'll say uh, I'm back and you might ask well why are you still concerned about this uh, according to the Kentucky Office uh, of Highway Safety in 2021 there were 794 people killed on Kentucky highways and a significant number of those I'm confident were impacted by people who were not paying attention who were distracted by their driving uh, there was also a, a Mason-Dixon poll that was done here in Kentucky from January 19th through 22nd of this year. And 81% of the people who responded to that poll supported requiring drivers to use hands-free voice command technology to make calls and communicate. And 88% said they would be very likely to obey a hands-free law. Now, in the past, uh, I've had people with me. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Smith, uh, who is a ad national advocate, uh, very passionate about this. She lost her mother to one of these accidents. She'd be here and tell you about all the other states who have done this, those surrounding Kentucky. Uh, I've had the Insurance Institute here, and, and they would tell you that uh, this is their number one legislative priority. Uh, I was at the Spencer County Farm Bureau meeting uh, last week. The agency manager gave his report, and he talked about the losses uh, that we've had here in Kentucky. And, and even in motor vehicles, just a tremendous amount of motor vehicle accidents. So just real briefly, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I did make my pre I did have my little prop here uh, in my Chevy Silverado pickup truck. I have three cup holders in the center. Uh, this is in my center cup holder. And uh, usually about the only time I use this for is when I've got my maps on. If I don't know where I'm going, uh, I can kind of keep up with my directions on this because I've also got Bluetooth technology in my truck. Uh, for those of you who don't have that, there's this little thing here you can buy. It's not very expensive. Put in your ear, pair it to your phone, and you do not have to have a phone in your hand to talk while you're driving. But... Uh, you should have in your packet uh, the proposed legislation for 23, uh, it's BR 22. And uh, that first section there, it talks about means to operate a motor vehicle on a highway. And in my presentation, I would like to uh, talk about some of the questions and po points of concern that people have had with me in the past. Driving a vehicle, operating a vehicle, motor vehicle on a highway is not a right. It is a privilege. In order to do that, you have to be a certain age. You have to have passed certain uh, tests. Uh, you have to um, have insurance. There are qualifications. And with that privilege comes laws. And probably the most prominent law that uh, is related to this, I'd say, would be the seatbelt law. Uh, if my friend, former Representative Jimmy Stewart, were here, he might have something to say about that. But uh, he, he's... He, he's, uh, he's He's back home uh, trading cattle today, I imagine. But uh, after the seatbelt law, people uh, confirm, conformed. And I think what this legislation is about, it's about, it's not meant to be punitive, it's about changing people's habits. And if I were to ask each and every one of you as you drive up and down the highways, if you observe the other drivers on the road with you, how many of them do you see with a phone in their hand? Uh, they're not paying attention to what they're doing. And uh, if I asked uh, each of us, have you been guilty of doing something maybe not so safe with an electronic device, I can raise my own hand there. Uh, since I've worked on this legislation, I'm much better. <laughs> uh, 
about that. But again, it's a privilege. Uh, you should have a, I asked staff to put together a one pager that you should have in your summary. And I'll just go through that. Uh, it just expands the, the term personal communication device, include things like computers. And why will we include computers? Several years ago, I had a friend of mine was talking about driving to Florida late at night. And I said, well, how in the world did you stay awake driving all night? He said, I was watching movies on my computer while I was driving. Folks, people do silly things. Uh, it includes computers, tablets, laptops, telephones, or any other substantially similar wireless device. It defines what a standalone electronic device is. Uh, it defines operating a motor vehicle. Uh, that means to include when the motor vehicle is temporarily stationary because of traffic, but does not include circumstances when the vehicle has pulled over to the side of the roadway. So if a driver uh, pulls over to the side of a drove of, of, of the roadway or someplace and they're stopped in a safe location, this legislation is not going to apply to them. And often when I've had to make important phone calls, I've actually pulled off because uh, maybe I need to look up some information or reference something. Uh, so that's always an option. Uh, it prohibits the handheld use of a device and the use of electronic device to stream, record, or broadcast video. And I know many times I've seen on Facebook and social media, uh, somebody will video something that they see while they're driving down the road. And, you know, it's interesting to see that, but I've often thought to myself, man, I'm glad they didn't have an accident while they were doing that. Uh, it would allow the pressing of a single button to activate, deactivate, or initiate a feature. Uh, if, uh, if one of you were to call my phone right now, I could push one button, turn that on. I could activate that so that I could talk to you. Uh, this option's available. Uh, most new technology, uh, as I said on my truck, if I want to, I made three phone calls on the way to Frankfurt this morning. I never touched my phone. I use the technology that's available in my truck, and that technology is growing and becoming more uh, available all the time. Allows the use by voice based communication uh, on a global uh, positioning or navigation system. Uh, allows you to automatically convert a voice-based communication to be sent as a message in written form. Now, I will be honest on my truck. When I get a text message, it alerts me right in the center of my truck. I can push a button, and it will ver orally tell me what that text message is. Did I hear a phone ringing? <laughs> well, let's see here. I've got it on, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I had it on silent. <laughs> it might have been part of the reason I was talking. Let's see if I missed a call here. I missed a call from Jimmy Higdon at 138. <laughs> but Just I, checking on you there. But it's on, it's on there, it's Mr. On Chairman. It's on I'm glad you listened to me and you had your phone on silent. I did. I did. But I'm going to be honest. I'm, I hadn't figured out yet how to verbally send a text message to somebody, so I'll wait till later to send that to them. It does allow the use of your communication, your phone in an emergency situation. Uh, another aspect of this, uh, uh, anyone under 18 years of age would not be allowed to hold their phone for any reason whatsoever except in an emergency situation or to use the integrated systems in their vehicle because of safety at that age. Uh, it does provide for uh, one change from last year's bill that I had last year's bill allow for a courtesy warning of three months period. I extended that for six months in this, year, in this year's legislation till January 1st, 2024, so an officer could issue a warning to people. Because this is an educational process, I don't want this to be punitive. Uh, there are punitive uh, elements to that. Uh, there are fines for first, second, and third uh, offenses. Uh, there is a provision where someone can lose three points off their license if they're driving, uh, doing this in a work zone or a school zone, and, and also if they cause an accident. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the legislation. That's kind of a little summary of what's in it, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions uh, that anyone has, Mr. Chairman. Senator Turner has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I asked a bunch last time, and some of the fellows have done nodded at me to ask, in, indicate whether I was going to ask a few. So, as I understand it, if my cell phone rings under this statute, 
I can't touch a button and answer him. If you're <laughs> just give you an example, Mr. Turner, like my I didn't hear the senator's call, but if I'd heard it, I could have pressed one button and answered that phone. But the, the what the law says is you cannot hold a phone in your hand or support it with any part of your body. That's what why and use that phone while you're driving. But it does not prevent you from, if you have your phone in a situation like this, I know some of them you can put them on a, uh, the air conditioner vent, uh, it will not prevent you. It allows you to use one button, one touch to activate a function on the phone. You can turn a phone on, you can answer a call, you could uh, turn, you could stop that call. And uh, additional questions, Mr. Chairman, if you have permission. Please, please proceed. Uh, so it doesn't affect the CB radios? It does not. Uh, but it doesn't affect anybody that's reaching down and getting their Coke, drinking it. Has nothing to do with food. No, Smoking, sir. chewing tobacco, and spitting out the windows. Well, I mean. <laughs> no, no those Sec other Senator things. Senator Turner, getting something out of the glove compartment. after I get this through the House, if you want to add that in the amendment, the committee sub, and send it back over, we'll talk. Now, <laughs> my question is, those things are still going to be legal, aren't they? There, there's. The, the only thing we have current laws on this, on uh, reckless driving is somebody's doing something recklessly. Uh, I once uh, dated a girl, uh, was coming to the girls' church softball league, and she told me she changed while she, into her uniform while she was driving. That would be <laughs> reckless driving. Uh, but uh, it, it does not – and I know we had this conversation last year. Uh, you know, I can reach over and pick up my cup, Diet Coke out of my cup holder and still look straight. But if I'm, if I'm ingrained on that phone in my hand, it's very easy to get lost in that phone. And, that, and, and we all know how society is, and that's what's happening. For the question, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> according, to, according to the way I read your bill, mm -hmm. if I'm sitting out here for two hours or four hours in one of these road construction things, I can't talk on that cell phone. You can if you've got it. Use one button, or you use your Bluetooth device. Okay. The Bluetooth is where it comes on automatically. Every it, time somebody if you, calls, if you, you have a phone, like, like in my truck, my phone is paired to my truck. Somebody calls, it, it lets me know somebody's ringing. Uh, I can push a button on the my uh, steering wheel, and I can we will have that conversation. If I want to call somebody, uh, I can initiate that from the push of one button on my steering wheel. Uh, using voice command and tell them who I want to call. And sometimes it has trouble if my accent calls somebody else, but uh, we can work with that. Further question, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, please proceed. If, if the bill should pass, you've got the penalties, uh, and you did mention the seatbelt law, which I was a uh, person mm -hmm. with, a good gentleman that uh, initially had it put together, and I insisted that they put a fine payment and people could mail it in. Mm -hmm. Would you be uh, inclined to take all this great punishment of points on your license and all that and allow people that's traveling through our state to uh, get a ticket and send a fine in and not have to come to court and all that uh, stuff that would add uh, lost jobs and with well, the gas prices, uh, Joe Biden's gas prices coming back from Ohio to go to court in Kentucky and all that. Would you be um, amenable, amenable to that? amendment to, to clear up all those things so they could just mail in a check and pay their fine if the bill should pay. Senator Turner, I'm, I'm open to any input that anybody might have and be more happy to talk to you about that uh, as legislation moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Thank you. Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, wanted to ask you, I know Tennessee already has a law like this. And of course, I only live 22 miles from the state line, travel in Tennessee quite a bit. And uh, you cannot ha have your phone in your hand there at all. Um, do you happen to know what their penalties are in regards to that? I am not familiar up to date with, with that. We can certainly look at what the surrounding states are doing. I'm certain we can get that information to you. And I do have Bluetooth in my car, and I do have a device that my phone sits in, and that it's a one-touch answer. I can do it with my finger on my steering wheel, or and I can voice text, too. 
You know, I can listen. You, you may have to teach me how to do that. Um, it's it's not that hard once you get a kid that you, you have to teach you. So, but anyway, I, I was just curious. I mean, I always ha- have to do that. I travel through Tennessee quite a bit, and uh, I have to make sure that I'm very careful. So I've gotten to, in the habit of doing that, and uh, it's not that hard. You really said not. the key. You said the key word there, habit. And I think what we have is we have a lot of drivers that have developed bad habits and and the use of these phones. uh, You know, back when the original texting law came in, we had texting. Now we've got Facebook. We've got Instagram. We've got Twitter. We've got TikTok and probably a thousand more I don't even know about. And and people are are ingrained in these apps, and they've developed bad driving habits. So that's that's, that's my purpose of this legislation. Yeah, it doesn't take but a... um half a second for you to veer off uh, when you're driving um, I mean you'll surprise yourself as to how far over the line sure. you are um, if you don't you know looking at your phone because I know I've been there mm-hmm. and so I, I'm a little bit reformed but not quite all the sure. way yet so but thank you Representative McCool thank you Mr. Chairman uh, Representative uh, you may have already ha- shared some of this, but I want to make sure. The um, and I appreciate you bringing this forward. Do you have data that shows that there's been a reduction in accidents because of this the, the, for those states who have implemented this? And can I add to that? Has there been a reduction in cost of insurance? The, that you're aware uh, of. I know that previously uh, I've had a representative from the National Transportation Safety Board that's appeared uh, before this committee. And I'm sure the data is out there. I'm going to be honest, I don't have the recent updated numbers. Uh, as far as the insurance, uh, I think they would be happy to provide that. I just spoke to a representative from a national insurance company who drove here from Columbus, Ohio today, just to be present at this committee hearing to hear this presentation. So they're very in tune with the increased cost of insurance, and I'm sure they'd be happy to help us get some information uh, going into session. We'll try and have all that available to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative McPherson. So uh, I have my phone paired with my truck, mm-hmm. but like coming up here, I'm fortunate enough lots of times I have my wife that'll drive me and I like to be on the phone. Mm-hmm. Is there a way to distinguish between that or or you know whose phone and if it's my truck but it's my phone and she's driving i mean do we have well what what how does the bill look at that the bill only impacts somebody who's operating a motor vehicle just yeah. the operator you would not if you were a passenger it would not have any impact on you whatsoever on the use of a phone or any other you could watch your movies you could do whatever you want to it's just the operator of the motor vehicle it's impacted so if i had a wreck and something but it was registered to me and it would still just be whoever was driving the vehicle would be yeah i mean somebody you know if if the operator of of, of the vehicle was holding a phone sure. or electronic device in their hand it was proven while they were driving uh that uh, the way the penalty phase is it would have an enhanced penalty yeah. well i'm saying if they were trying to go back and read records to look and see who was Mm. who it was registered to and all these things it, it, it don't it would just be the driver yeah the the, okay. b- the bill only addresses the operator of the motor vehicle okay thank you okay <clears throat> seeing no further questions oh okay yeah. representative health yes thank you mr chairman do you know what the current uh penalty would be now if I was riding down the road and watching a movie on my computer, I mean, is there is there no penalty for, for distracted driving? I know texting and driving currently is illegal. Mm-hmm. But so if I have my computer sitting on my dash and watching a movie and driving down the road and a police officer spotted me doing that, is there no penalty for that now? The, the only, again, the only I think the only penalty that could be applied there is that someone that the officer saw someone driving recklessly and, and recognized that as part of it. But right now, the law only addresses texting while you're driving. And that's one of the issues that the police have told me. Uh, somebody, sometimes people use a defense. They'll say, I wasn't texting and driving. I was on Facebook or I was checking my email. But, uh, I, I, you know, 
there may be other statutes that I'm not aware of, uh, but as far as the revisions in this statute, we're just revising our texting statutes and adding this to include be more inclusive. So quick, quick follow up. So it, it's perfectly fine right now to for me to drive down the road and look at Facebook or Instagram or any of that. And there's no penalty whatsoever. If I, it's my under, if, it's my understanding, unless can, you were to do unless you were weaving all over the road. But uh, as far as uh, uh, I mean, I mean, an officer could stop you and ask you if you're texting. But that is the defense a lot of people will use. I wasn't texting; I was on Facebook or sent, doing checking email or things like that. Okay. Thank there's, you. There's no specific, um, no, no language that deals with that. Currently, there is correct. Not. That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, seeing no further questions, I know I see the KMA uh, representatives in the back of the room. They've been. Uh, express their concerns about this uh, um, legislation and, and the uh, negative effects that it has on motorcyclists uh, by folks using the driving and using a cell phone. Um, <clears throat> next on the agenda, I lost my agenda, Representative Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, for allowing us to be here today to present uh, this piece of legislation uh, that I actually began in 2021. Representative Blanton, please introduce yourself for the record. And, and yes, uh, Representative John Blanton uh, from the 92nd District, and I have I'll allow Jason to uh, introduce himself. And I'm Jason Sawala, Deputy State Highway Engineer for the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Mr. Chairman, as I was saying, in 2021, I first introduced uh, this piece of legislation to begin the conversation working in conjunction with the transportation cabinet focusing on highway safety uh, in our work zones. Uh, don't know uh, if you're aware of this. Uh, I think sometimes uh, Representative Tipton talked about uh, habits. Uh, I think we sometimes get in habits of, of doing things and we get complacent. Uh, and one of those things um, is in our highway work zones, and there's a lot of that going on, uh, and I'm glad that it is going on across the state. Um, but it's also a very dangerous situation for those that are out there working uh, on these road projects. Um, as a matter of fact, just in Kentucky alone, uh, in 2021, we had 1,247 crashes within work zones in Kentucky resulting in 299 injuries and seven fatalities uh, in those work zones. In 2020, we had 905 crashes with 228 injuries and six fatalities. Thus far in, in uh, 2022, we've had 860 crashes with 226 injuries and five fatalities. Now I go back just a couple years ago to a young man from McGoffin County by the name of Jared Helton. He grew up with my youngest daughter, a uh, fine young man, had uh, a, uh, uh, a wonderful life uh, ahead of him, come from a good family. Um, his, uh, uh, what he would accomplish in life uh, is immeasurable. And unfortunately, he was working on a road project uh, when he was hit and killed by a tractor trailer, uh, working simply on a road project. And I can tell you as my time as a, uh, as a trooper, one of the very worst accidents, fatalities that I ever worked was in a work zone. Uh, it was just uh, uh, one of those that stick with me and always have for 30 years now because of the sight uh, that I had to see. Keep in mind, these are accidents that are occurring not between vehicles, but between vehicles and a human. And we owe it to them to provide them safety while they're out there working, uh, doing the jobs to make our highways better, uh, make our highways safer, uh, so that we can uh, uh, have means not only for our transportation, but for commerce as well. So in 2021, I introduced a piece of legislation uh, that would allow for the transportation cabinet to enact a pilot project uh, using automated, automated speed enforcement uh, in selected work zones across the Commonwealth. Uh, what we've seen nationwide is uh, states that have enacted these programs, we've seen a reduction in fatalities and injuries 
in these work zones. Uh, and we owe it to our construction workers in these zones to provide for the safest possible uh, work environment that we can. And so with these automated, uh, this automated system, um, it would, uh, their cameras, they would take a photograph uh, with uh, the speed uh, that is then um, recorded by the cameras and this is then mailed to them uh, and they are fined. Uh, first offense is $75, second offense uh, and subsequent offense, I believe it was $125, uh, Jason. Um, the, the difference here is it's not going through our district courts uh, in this and I know this is something we can have further conversations about whether that would work or not, but the purpose of that was one of the biggest things in fines today, quite frankly, is not the fine itself, but it's the court cost. And the court cost is about $140 today, right? Uh, up, it's up, it's even higher than that. So uh, it keeps going up. So one, we wanted to keep, keep it reasonable, uh, but two, the money was just also to be used to regenerate and to provide for other highway safety programs in the work zones. That's what the money was to be uh, capitalized and, and, and used for. So uh, we were simply looking at a means of uh, providing uh, safety for our workers. And I, I would also add, there is an appeals process. Let's say a vehicle goes through and it, it captures the vehicle. Uh, there is a defense that you weren't driving. If you can bring proof that you weren't driving uh, or a, a sworn statement that you weren't, but you would have to provide the, the name of the driver. Uh, but there is an appeals process uh, for those that would like to appeal it. Uh, and, and that's just a, a broad overview. And, and I'm going to turn it over to Jason for, for any further details on it. I'm sure I've left something important out. Nope, you did a great job. One, one clarification that I would make is those, those crash numbers those are uh, those are both crashes between vehicles and with um, and with uh, vulnerable workers in the in the work zones. However, um, you know it is uh, it, it certainly is not uncommon for vehicles to encroach uh, into the actual work area, sometimes striking workers as well. So this is this is something that's important not only for worker safety but for highway safety for those who are traveling uh, in through and around our work zones. So, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple of years back when uh, the unfortunate accident with Mr. Helton happened, I spoke with his mother and family and we began this process. Uh, and then uh, a few months ago, I was contacted by the Kentucky Association of Highway Contractors uh, asking and encouraging me to continue my, my push on this piece of legislation because of protection. And you will have, you should have in your packet a letter uh, from the uh, uh, Kentucky Association Highway Contractors. It's, it's in there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Supporting uh, this piece of legislation, and, and I'm willing to work. You know, if it needs to be tweaked, we'll, we'll tweak it. The, the, the primary thing that we're looking to do here is find a way to provide protection for our workers out in these work zones when they're out there day in and day out working in a very dangerous situation. That's all we're trying to accomplish here is to provide them with the safest work environment we can. And with that, Mr. Chairman, if Jason has nothing else, then uh, I would entertain any questions. Okay, thank you very much. My first question would be, who, who uh, administers the, I guess, where's the equipment come from? Who purchases that? And then who, who looks at the equipment uh, or the video to figure out who, um, who receives a, a um, I guess, a electronic ticket? By the way, we currently have it set up in, in, in the 2021 language. That would be through the transportation cabinet. Okay. All right. Jason, I, I know you do a lot with the highway safety, and thank you for your work. Um, of course, we heard Representative Tipton and now um, on with the uh, hands-free and, and now the work zone uh, with um, Representative Blanton. How many, how many and I know Kentucky's uh, – death rate on their accident and death rate on the highways is uh, is creeping up uh, we had a fairly significant decrease when we passed the seatbelt legislation several years ago but and in your statistics and what you watch it as far as um, deaths on Kentucky highways what are you seeing as um, workplace accidents um, hands for our 
distracted driving. What what are you seeing as as um, some of the reasons for that increase in death toll? So as as the representative mentioned, you know, there's there's been a significant amount of crashes and. Uh, throughout uh, the last couple of years, we have seen some increases uh, where we had previously been seeing some incremental decreases. And so, you know, over the past uh, several years, you know, you've seen uh, increased speeds, increased distraction. I, I think, you know, Representative Tipton mentioned that, uh, you know, on your way here today to Frankfurt, you may have uh, you may have seen someone uh, along your journey who was uh, distracted as they were as they were driving along. And so distracted driving is certainly one of those things that that drives that. And as uh, Representative Blanton said, as we talk about this specifically for work zones, we want to make sure that uh, people are aware uh, not only that they're coming into a work zone. And one of the provisions of this is that uh, signage would have to be placed specifically in the work zone to uh, let people know that there were these automated enforcement uh, via civil penalty uh, that were occurring, but we want to make sure that people are engaged in that driving behavior and that, uh, to the to the best of their ability, that they're making safe choices behind the wheel, whether they're in work zones or not. And so, as we look at those at those different things, um, the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety, you know, focuses on things such as aggressive driving, which includes speeding, uh, you know, not not uh, stopping for traffic signals or not stopping for stop signs. Uh, distracted driving, obviously, uh, impaired driving, uh, occupant protection, which would include seatbelts and child safety seats, uh, roadway departures, uh, which is uh, a primary safety concern, uh, particularly in rural areas of our Commonwealth, uh, and also vulnerable road users, which would include uh, motorcyclists, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, and in this context, certainly uh, workers out there on the roadway. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Representative Blanton, I, I know in um, Representative Bratcher's um, district this past summer on uh, Gene Snyder Freeway between Billtown Road and Bartstown Road, the orange barrels were out two, three weeks, uh, and the all the signage was up prior to any road work starting. Would, does this have to be an active um, um, construction site or actual people working before this uh, these uh, fines are implemented or just any any work zone? Well, the current language does not specify that there has to be actual workers there just be in a work zone, but I am very open to uh, tweaking the language to ensure it's at a time when we actually have physical work going on with individuals because um, that's who we're trying to protect is those workers there. And, and I understand what you're saying. But you also got to remember there's a time when they're setting those barrels up. There's people out there working. So those times have to be taken into consideration as well. Okay. Representative Bratcher has a question. Is, is this the flock system? You know what that is? F-L-O-C-K, where you take a picture of a license plate and keep a, keep a database of it. Have you heard of that? Uh, Where does the information it, go once it, the it goes picture? to transportation? They would issue a fine. Uh, once it's resolved, there would be no reason for them to uh, to record the license plate and hold on to the image. I mean, there's nothing in here that lays out a retention uh, on holding the license plates. Uh, I, I think you're talking about something where they use cameras to basically run uh, information, seeing if something's stolen, and so forth and so on. And that this system doesn't do that. Uh, I will say this as well, since we're talking about phones earlier and hands-free, I know in states that I've been through, and I would think this would be possible to implement to, uh, because again, we're not wanting to punish people, we're wanting to protect people, right? And to give them even far, uh, even more fair warning, uh, I've been in states that have these type cameras and I'm using my, my, my app, my, my maps on my phone <laughs> And it will pop up on my phone that I'm getting ready to come into one of these cameras, right? To remind me to slow down. And I'm sure that that could be implemented because, again, the goal here is not to punish people, but to simply get people to slow down so we protect people in these work zones. Representative McCool has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you really already asked my question. I was just going to ask if this applied 24-7 when construction was going on and, and, and weekends when it was not, something like that. So yeah, I think you already answered my question. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Hale. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Blanton. I think this is a, a, a tremendous um, piece of legislation that you're, that you're moving forward here. Uh, a couple of questions. The cameras would be where? Where would the cameras be at these sites? They would be placed within the work zone on a device designed for these cameras to capture uh, vehicles as they pass through the work zone. May I follow up with a couple other questions? Yes, Mr. please do. So these cameras would, would record the license plate numbers of these vehicles and then that information of that plate or the owner of that car would be sent to the transportation department itself that's correct and then the, the fines would be implemented through the transportation department as well correct these would be civil fines not criminal fines okay uh, and the, the gentleman you mentioned the tragic loss of the person a couple of years ago correct Jared Hilton yes and and I think that uh, and I don't know how many of these happen around the country each year I'm sure there's there's several of those uh, tragic things that happen. I've been very adamant over the last few years about cameras uh, to protect not only our workers, but also our vulnerable children on our buses that I have filed legislation on the last two years. And we haven't had a tragic death. We had a, we've had incidences of near misses. And I'm afraid that it's gonna take a tragic death of a child we had a parent that was killed by a person passing a bus and my and i know this may be a little off target off subject here but my my point here is we're wanting to implement we're wanting to put cameras out there to protect the highway workers and that's great but we can't seem to get enough support to implement cameras on school buses to protect the most vulnerable people in our society and, and I saw a Franklin County bus here just the other day. A student was getting off the Franklin County bus and some on the camera, on the, on the inside camera of that bus recorded a student missed by just inches. So I'm all for your bill. I think it's a great implementation for somehow a reason or another we haven't been able to get this across and I'm hoping and praying that it doesn't take the death of a student to implement something to protect the most vulnerable people out there, and that's the children getting off and off of these buses. And the reluctance to do this is is beyond me. So, I, I appreciate your bill. Uh, it's not here to that's not here to try to build up something for myself. I'm just saying I'm all for that. And I I would kind I would almost say that you you made the statement it's to protect, and not to punish. Well, in a sense, it is to punish people that are doing these kind of acts that are putting our, our citizens' lives at danger. And they need to pay a high price for that because it's happening and I'm afraid it's gonna to continue to happen and I certainly support your piece of legislation and uh, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two statements about this bill it's, and it's not that I'm against it. Uh, but the, wouldn't the logical second step be to just put them on all roads and just stop all speeding everywhere? And is that something we're interested in doing? And the second statement would be, I hope that uh, they keep better records than the toll bridges because I sell a lot of cars and we transfer them immediately when we sell them and we'll get a bill a month after we've sold it, you know, saying we crossed the bridge and then, you know, to pay the toll. So I just wanted to, mentioned that also that's all i had thank you senator wheeler thank you mr chairman and and i, I think that the um the goal of this bill is something that just about every one of us can get behind um you know but i i i, I guess i do have a couple questions first i mean with the transportation cabinet be purchasing these systems and, and placing them out on the road themselves, or would they be contracting with the third-party vendor to do this? 
so without without the legislation being passed, we haven't kind of gone all the way down that road. But there there are certainly vendors out there who provide these types of services in partnership with other states and, and municipalities who allow for this sort of thing. So what we would be doing is evaluating, uh, you know, because the, the legislation is for a pilot project. Sure. And so our, our goal would be to evaluate what's out there, uh, which we have started to do, but we haven't made any final decisions yet, uh, you know, because that would be a little premature at this point. Okay. But, the, you... but, but there there's the potential for either of those options. Okay. I mean, do most states use a third-party vendor or do most states uh, operate this in-house? I, I think that it's somewhat split. I think that um, you know, throughout the United States, there are uh, there are several jurisdictions that allow for this sort of thing, and and those implementations have taken place over you know say a decade or more. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there's definitely been some evolution uh, both in the in the purchase and in the private sector offerings during that time. So I think that there you would probably find if you took a poll of all the states that it's somewhat uh, split, but anecdotally from what i've heard recently many states are are contracting as opposed to uh doing in-house and i guess that's one of my concerns because i guess you know we've all experienced lately if you were to contest something or something like this you or if you just like you call into amazon well you probably would never call into amazon you got to go online because nobody's going to talk to you uh if you pick up the phone or if you do get somebody on the phone you know they're in uh Southeast Asia or somewhere like that trying to answer your questions and you know you are doing something here which is either going to cost somebody money and uh, I would assume potentially some points on their license which could impact no this would not at all no it does not this is through transportation this does not go the way it's written, this does not go through the courts. I mean, we don't have an actual bill here, so that's why I was asking. Yes, the way it is currently, the way it would currently be written, it would all go through transportation. It's a civil fine, and not through the district courts, and there would be no points against someone's license. Um, Senator Wheeler, he filed that bill two years ago. 2021. Uh, 2021. I did go back and read it. That is civil fines. Okay. I guess one of the thing would these things be operating when folks are not in the work zone? So, say on weekends or at nights, if you're driving on the parkway, you know, I mean, anybody's going east, it's it's an absolute mess right now for about. Which is a good thing. We're glad with the progress, but you know, sometimes it takes a while to get there. You know, at night nobody's working and things like that. So, would this uh, would this also apply during those, or would they be shut down at a certain hour? The- Currently, the way it would be written, it doesn't specify, but I, I would ask, is it still safe to speed through a work zone at night and at dark when you got a much narrow passageway, even for the driver? But I'm willing to have the conversation if we need to to narrow the time frame down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Senator Wheeler, I'm glad you mentioned one of my favorite things, orange barrels. It's a sign of progress. <laughs> yeah. Representative Smith. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess this is for the uh, highway department. Uh, I remember in Tazewell, they had cameras going when you went uh, on Cumberland Gap towards uh, 81. Uh, when you drive through there, they had, and if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, um, they had to be taken out because of entrapment. Uh, is, there, is there anything here that would fall under that? guideline or have you heard of heard of something similar to that to where they had these automatics uh cameras for speeding and uh they, they've now been taken out i believe because of the court ruling on entrapment but uh, f- first of all i think it's a great idea uh representative that uh i myself have seen close calls with a lot of i-75 work going on over the years uh, I think it's important that we have some sort of safety measures like this. But uh, <clears throat> I just remember that happening in Tazewell uh, for a period of time, and now they've been taken out, and I thought it was over a court ruling. 
I'm not familiar with that particular court ruling, but I, I can say that uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, you know, has done a lot of work kind of looking at, um, at the different um, legislative frameworks that these things have been implemented. As the representative mentioned, this is not a uh, this is not a criminal item, and this is one of those things where uh, our goal really uh, is to have the system collect nothing because we really don't want people speeding through the work zones. And so, the the goal is to provide notice even beyond uh, you know the signs and things that you pass by right now that uh, this type of system is in in place and operating. Uh, so that it's explicitly known by anybody who's traveling uh, ahead of when they would uh, encounter those devices uh, because the, the goal is, again, the goal is not to collect revenue. The goal is to, to change behavior and to improve safety of those that are traveling in or through the work zones and also those that are working in them. Well, the, the, what caught my attention was the criminal side of it, getting away from a spit regular speeding ticket. So I thought maybe that was a reason why. I didn't know, but I pre appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Seeing no further questions, thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. That concludes Chairman. our uh, agenda for today. Uh, see all of you on high noon, hopefully January the 3rd. Motion to adjourn. We have a motion.